Welcome to a special edition of Stories of Briscoe and Bradshaw. I would be Bradshaw, and that would be your Chickasaw native, your Chickasaw Hall of Famer, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And we've got a treat today. I've been doing research on this gentleman because he has one of the favorite songs that I've ever heard in my life, and that is Will the Circle Be Unbroken? But you got four, plat four platinum records, five gold records. 46 albums, seven of those are solo. He's got a book out. He worked with Steve Martin on a Grammy Award winning 2010 album. And he's got a new album out, The Newsman, which is a spoken word album, which is absolutely fantastic. He is Mr. John McEwen. John, welcome to the show. Thank you. I don't know how to follow all that. Sounds like, I, a, a, sounds like a pretty good deal. I think it is a pretty good deal. I've, I've been seeing the interviews you've done, so I, I know it's a good deal. So I'm just hoping that we can hold uphold our part because we're just a couple old wrestlers that aren't that bright. You'll do fine. <laughs> we're not that bright, but we're music of appreciation of music. And your music, is, uh, I've been from Oklahoma job from Texas, so your style of music, uh, it, it, it hits home with, with both of us. Like John said, circle me, I broke, but uh, you know, my favorite is Mr. Bojangles. Got to be Mr. Bojangles, you know. And by, by a great Texan, I might write Jerry Jeff Walker also. So, right, yeah. Jerry Jeff. So, uh, you know, and doing, doing the research, Don, we found some really, really cool stuff about you growing up. And, and I have to ask you because I'm an Oki, was your family did that? Because where, where you grew up, where you were born, or you it was kind of the Oki uh, uh, immigration uh, mi migration out there from from the Dust Bowl days. Did you, was your parents in, in that or what? No, my mother was the type that says, "A damn Oki's going to get that job." <laughs> Oki, you know, that, and I, I didn't know what an Oki was when I was five <laughs> years old or seven years old, but she was always talking about the Oki invasion, and then I started understanding it, and I went. Well, you know, they were looking for a new place, and yeah. Woody Guthrie helped them find it. And yeah. and, <laughs> and you know, back when I was growing up, Oki was a cuss word to, to us people that lived out in Oklahoma. John Steinbeck, you know, he kind of made it derogatory for a long time, and now yeah. now we embrace it with pride. You know, we're proud to be Okies. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I had to find that out myself. I was proud to. Well, my mom, my dad would say. When are you going to quit playing that Oki music? <laughs> I love That's it. That's great. <laughs> that is great. I said, well, a lot of it's really good. And, you know, and, and uh, you know, Bob Wills is from Texas. He just happens to play in Oklahoma. And, uh, a lot, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Kane's Ballroom, he played a lot in Tulsa. Kane's Ballroom. Did you, have you ever played Kane's Ballroom? Oh, man. I went into the, the office to collect the money when we were playing Kane's Ballroom. And there were two shotguns right next to his desk. Yeah. And I, looked at him, I looked at him being from California going, shotguns, huh? He goes, yeah. And they're loaded. They're ready for action. <laughs> I said, how do you tell, how do you tell when you've had a successful show here at Kane's Ballroom? And he goes, oh, we count the number of teeth on the floor at the end of the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yo, know, yo, know, John. Not not only was it a great music hall, but that that's where my brother and I we went to Oklahoma State University after school. We went and, and became professional wrestlers at Cade Ballroom. That they had a ring set up there, and that's where we went to train and 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 learn learn all the holds and learn learn the secrets of professional wrestling. So uh -huh. it's kind of a cool spot to be a country fan. I mean, uh, all my life, you know, from from my grandparents on. Go in there and just feel that vibrations of all the great stars who had passed through that through that that venue. There, it's one of the iconic venues in the world. I think. Yeah. I went and sat in with Bob Wills' band. Yeah. And Bob Wills was doing a reunited a reun reunion type of show for his birthday. You know, Wills had been dead many years, uh -huh. and it was just a, a hoot to play banjo with this band. And the sax player, after every song, he'd go, I love show business. I <laughs> love, after every song, I love show business. Yeah. And uh, the next time I played Queen's Ballroom, Leon Russell, who had become a friend over the years, he yeah. came to see us in 1966. Wow. Through a baby band, you know, just rehearsing at a club. And he came to see if we wanted to sign a record deal. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, but we already have. We just signed with Liberty Records. Yeah. Oh, well, that's who I was thinking of signing you with. And, okay, yeah. can, you mind if I listen to you rehearse? 
No, no. go right ahead. He was in a business suit. He wasn't Leon Russell, long hair yet. Yeah, oh yeah. 1966. Yeah. He was part of the wrecking crew in LA, which became famous. That's what I was going to ask you if you were involved in that wrecking crew when when uh, Leon Russell came out there, all all the great uh, talent that he had involved there, and how how they actually changed the, the style of music during that time frame. Well, the wrecking crew, for those that don't know, was a group of LA musicians, maybe 20, 25 people. Carol Kay on bass, uh, or Joe Osborne on bass, and and different three different piano players and some guitar players, and they would make up most of the records. I mean, they play on uh, uh, they played on various Birds albums and Carpenters and all kinds of groups. You know, uh, yeah. Nancy Sinatra. All uh, two thirds of the records coming out of L.A. had these guys on it, yeah. and they were really great. Yeah, studio players. Yeah, I just read that book, Masters of Space, Space and Time, Leon Russell. Oh, I did too. Yeah. That outstanding book, man. That takes you through the rock and roll history like no other book I've ever ever read. I didn't know Leon, you know, he's an okay, of course. I didn't know he had that much influence in, in the old old school rock and roll. But you go back, I mean, the Beach Boys, you know, everybody came to that studio and, and played with Leon Russell. Yeah, and they were that was interesting because they were playing with him, not because he was Leon Russell, but because of his talent. Because of his innovations, right? Because of his ability with the piano. He yeah. called me up once uh, in the 70s. I'm on the road with the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, where I spent 50 years of my life with Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. Thank you very much. And <laughs> uh, it, he called me up. I was on the road, and he says, uh, can you be here in Santa Monica in about three days? I, I'm doing a Bill Wyman session. And I had to go on the phone. Hey, who's Bill Wyman? And, <laughs> and the other bandmate said, he plays in the Rolling Stones. Why? I said, oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, Leon. I, uh, oh, oh, yeah, put him on. He put on Bill Wyman, and I'm talking to a Rolling Stone. And, and he was very nice. He's very nice. And I said, okay, I'll see and a few days later, I was in L.A., and Leon came out to meet me at the studio. He goes, oh, I'm glad you're here. I've already played my three licks. Uh -huh. you know, I, I think you have more than three, right, Leon. <laughs> I'm glad to put in my three. Yeah. And uh, that was a fun album to play on. Did you guys play the church out, out in Tulsa? The church? No. Yeah, I had, I had... Didn't know about it. Didn't know about yeah, it. Yeah, that, that was his main uh, studio after, 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 right. after uh, it was a church, Pentecostal church. He used to go there. Then went to, somehow a Pentecostal church went out of business. Imagine that. But, uh, but uh, he, he bought it, turned it into a, a studio and it right. became a hot spot there in Tulsa for years. I recorded at his house in yeah. uh, 76. Out on the lake. No, I don't remember a lake. It was a big house where he had to take the house and tilt it back and dig <laughs> it in deep to make a studio underground and then put the house back down. Wow. And, and anyway, he did it. And we're recording this song. It's on the Dirt Band album, Stars and Stripes Forever, I think. No, no, uh, some other album. One yeah. of Jimmy Evanson's songs called Joshua Come Back Home to the Island. Anyway. Leon ends up playing piano, and this guy playing drums was Teddy Jack Eddy. Well, his real name was, you know, the guy that played Buddy Holly in the movie. Uh, what's his name? The famous actor now. No, 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 no. Wasn't Joaquin, was it? No, the guy that played Buddy Holly in the movie Buddy Holly. Uh, I, uh, I anyway. remember that movie. I've watched it several times. Uh, uh, Buddy Holly, I mean, you know, I, I I never got to meet him. I saw him play there in Oklahoma City one time. Oh, you and did? I, How lucky. Yeah, and I I got to see him play when I was a kid out there. But uh, 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 Waylon Jennings was, was a good friend of mine before he passed away. I used to go around and hook up with Waylon a lot. We were on the road a lot together. What was it, John Gary Busey? Pardon? 
Was it Gary Busey? Yeah, you beat me to it, darn it. <laughs> well, I, I Googled it. <laughs> so I went, <laughs> That's what I'm I not, was doing. I'm not smart, but I can type. Yeah. But Mr. Google, Mr. Google saves us a lot of time here, John. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Well, he went yeah. by the name Teddy Jack Eddie, and yeah. he hadn't done He was on his way to Austin the next day to start that movie. So that was that was kind of fun. We didn't know. I didn't know he was mo- going to be a movie star and all that. But uh, next time I saw him was with Tommy Lee Jones at the Directors Guild Theater in L.A. Oh. I, when I did I did the music for the Good Old Boys, uh-huh. one, of Tommy, one of Tommy Lee's mu- uh, movies he directed. Uh-huh. And I sat between Gary Busey and Tommy Lee Jones. Wow, the film. that was really something. <laughs> John, have you like when you first started? You you have played with basically everybody from the generation before you to the generation of yours to the generation now. Or have you ever been at any point, especially when you first got started, where you've been overwhelmed with somebody and thought, "Man, this is this is kind of cool." Uh, no, not overwhelmed, but uh, I, I'd better not blow it <laughs> right uh, i better play my best at whatever i'm doing like playing with leon russell on stage was really fun and he was so dominating that you just i played the fiddle and banjo with him a few times and but playing the fiddle was easy because he drove the music and it was all gonna be good and it was all good and yeah, that time Edgar Winter was on guitar and sax and Leon piano and drums and bass. And anyway, that was really fun. And let's see. Well, playing with Johnny Cash was pretty... Uh, pretty, uh, pretty intimidating right there. <laughs> but I got... You know, when you give somebody's mother-in-law a gold record, it helps you... <laughs> it introduces you to them. Johnny yeah. Cash's mother-in-law was Maybell Carter. Uh, Mother Maybell. Mother Maybell Carter. And that's somebody that my brother and I really wanted on the Will the Circle Be Unbroken album. When I put that album together with my brother, Bill, he was our manager and record producer. Uh, well, we, we uh, I asked Earl Scruggs and Doc Watson if they'd record. And they said, I'd be proud to you. And then Bill says, I'm going to call Merle Travis on Monday. Uh-huh. He got Merle Travis. And then Wednesday, I said to Earl, do you think you could ask me, Bill Carter? And, and uh-huh. Earl came back the next day. I mean, this is by phone. This is not by fax. There were no fax machines. There were no, there was no cell phones or anything. And anyway, Maybell was in. And Louise, that was Earl's wife. Can you ask Jimmy Martin? Well, I'll ask him. I'm not sure what he'll, he'll probably say yes. Well, <clears throat> we didn't know that Jimmy Martin was as colorful as he was going to be. Anyway, it came together. And I don't know if you asked a question or what. I'm just rambling. No, on. no, that, that, that's that's what we, I want to hear. Is, is what you, I asked you a question about how working with guys, you know, cause I remember our first, you know, a few matches and I know Jerry Briscoe say, you know, we work with some of these old guys that you, you grew up idolizing, you know, it's kind of, sometimes it's overwhelming or, or like you say, you just, I want to do my part. I don't want to screw up, especially. I had this- no, no choice sitting next to Earl Scruggs to play the banjo the way he had shown me when he wasn't around just on his records. I played, uh, let's see, Lonesome Fiddle Blues, uh, Nashville Blues played three songs with him on the Circle album, and it was like, ah, well, Soldier's Joy was easy. That was the reason the album came together, in my mind, because I had wanted to record with Earl since I started playing the banjo, you know, and so what? You want to record with Earl? So do a thousand other people, and the chance came up to ask him if he'd record. I had a band now. I played in Nashville. He came to see us. And anyway, that all came together and we recorded Soldier's Joy and then did uh, Nashville Blues. And sitting next to him was just like, 
it was like he would play in my instrument, you know? Right. That was really cool. Was he the best you ever played with? Well, Earl Scruggs had a sound, and it was called the Scruggs banjo style. Now, a lot of people like to sound like Earl, but they sound more like each other. <laughs> you know, there's one guy named Charlie Hedgecock, uh, Charlie, Charlie in Nashville. Um, he sounds like Earl. He's really, I love to play with Charlie. And, uh, but um, it's like Elvis singers, you know? There's a bunch of Elvis impersonators out there. They all sound like each other. They don't that's sound right. like that's Elvis. Right. <laughs> where, 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 do, where would you put your, your classify your friend Steve Martin banjo player? A lot like Scruggs or a lot like who? He plays his own style and is very good. It's very, right. he has really, he's been intent on being a banjo player from when he started playing. I first started showing him stuff back when we both started. Because Steve and I went to high school together and we met at 16 years old. That's what I was going to ask you. At that time, could you see a star and and, and Steve at, uh, as as you guys were coming up? But he had that talent at N8. You know, some guys you're around and they just, you know, they just breathe that breathe that air of stardom. What, was Steve one of those type guys? I don't. Well, we both were trying to get a job in the magic shop in Disneyland. <laughs> and we did, same day. 16 years old, and we did magic tricks all day, selling magic tricks, you know? And I don't know, I didn't see. And then when he started his act five years later, half of it came from the magic shop. So it was <laughs> like, you know, it wasn't special other than it was him and he was different. And then yeah. as he was writing for the Smothers show, he was developing his act. <clears throat> and I think around 1972, I started thinking, this guy's special. He's going to be good. He's going to be equivalent. He's going to, and I got my brother to start managing him. Now, you said that he's going to be good. Was that with the magic, was the comedy, or or, the, or, or what, what, what genre of entertainment? Or did you see that last market? It was it was Steve Martin. It was because he was funny, because he was <laughs> he was uh energetic on stage. He was uh and when he played the banjo, which he always did when he when the comedy bits didn't go over, he'd pick up his banjo and start playing it to give him a time to think. <laughs> you know, and and right. give him a minute and a half, then he'd stop and then to get into the next bit and uh that was a fun thing you mentioned you mentioned your brother uh and he was a, a, one of the books that you put out about the uh, circle beyond broken out 145 photos you have some backstage uh things about every single photo which is really cool to, to have history like that recorded was your brother always a partner with you uh I, I seems to to me he was, but it seems to him that I, I think it seemed to him that he was working with me or something. It wasn't like equal because he was a manager and he took he got more money out of everything. You know, <laughs> it wasn't an even split at all. Uh, uh, That's kind of like John with me. <laughs> that's right. I, yeah, he's he's an Oki, and I trick him a lot. It's easy. Oh yeah, that's good. But but Bill and I worked on things very closely, and I road managed the Dirt Band for years. And when we started, I was the only one old enough to rent a car, so I rented the car. We'd go to Boston. I I was twenty one. I'd have to rent the car and drive us there. So that started a 12 year trip of road managing and getting there and then playing. I remember the first time in Boston, we were playing a club and I went into the bank the day before because I had a wire transfer coming in because I needed some cash. Bill, send me some money. And I go in, I get the money 
it was like four hundred dollars. And then I go back the next day with with uh, the money from the club, which was like three thousand or something, some small amount. And I had to wire that back to the bank. <laughs> and the guy, well, that was a quick turnaround. I said, <laughs> soybeans. <laughs> so <good> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I knew, like I went and bought soybeans in the futures. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And turned it around. <laughs> That's great. Somebody <laughs> there is telling somebody next to him, going, this guy's a genius. We got to figure yeah. out what he's doing. Yeah, it didn't go very. Uh, then I went on to the next day, yeah. but uh, that was a lot of fun. Bill was a, a real genius with showbiz things. He would wake up in the middle of the night and think of an album cover idea, and write it down, and then the next day he'd look at it and go, "Oh yeah," you know. I mean, you know, a lot of people think in their sleep, right? You know, to work in their sleep. You know the old phrase, I'll sleep on it. That is a real true thing. You will sleep on it. Einstein thought of E equals MC squared in his sleep, he professed. I you know? I'd never heard that. And I'm a huge Einstein fan. I, I've oh, never heard oh, that. Check it out. I, I don't mind being wrong, but I don't. No, think... no, no. I, I, just, I, I, always, I grew up reading all kinds of books about Einstein. I was just enamored with him. He's just such an interesting character. It was he was so weird, couldn't couldn't make change, but he could make the world change. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and, and J. Edgar Hoover had a, a lookout for him. And here, here's a, a German Jew flee, fleeing Hitler, and J. Edgar Hoover thought he was a threat to the United States. So for some reason, oh. figures <laughs> exactly. He just wanted a new dress, maybe. <laughs> exactly well, when you're right. when you're looking back, John, I know we're jumping around here a lot, but I I, I got I got nitty gritty dirt band. How did how did you guys form, and what what's is there a meaning behind the band, or is it just a, a cool name? <laughs> it was a a bunch of guys that were 16, 17, 18, 19 and I would say I was twenty when we started, and. You can't be that young and have a plan for your life. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it can you can be that young and have a plan for the next little while. Yeah. And that was like, let's get together and do a band then, okay? Yeah. What are we gonna call it? Uh, let's call it nitty gritty band. Another guy said, let's call it dirt band. Huh. Let's call it well, let's call it nitty gritty dirt band. <laughs> Okay, and that's how long that took. <laughs> a big decision. Huh? It took me fifty years to live it down. <laughs> uh, I, I played there for fifty years, and it was quite a run. I can't believe right. believe it was half a century. Uh, you know, <laughs> we played everything. We played everything. You know, the, uh, tell me the room that Kennedy was, uh, Robert was assassinated in. The the town or the the room. Oh, I don't. I don't remember. I, I remember the ambassador in, uh, hotel, the ambassador hotel in L.A. Right. Oh yeah, the ambassador. Nitty gritty dirt band played there the next night. Wow! Because there was four school proms going on at one time, all bunched together in one prom. And <laughs> oh, boys, uh, when you're going to the stage, don't don't walk on the other side of that tape. That's where. Uh, well, you know, that's where Kennedy got shot. Wow. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, it was like really weird. We did you hear? Did you things. hear anything? Any scuttlebutt or anything from the crew or anything about it? No, you didn't hear anything. You didn't. Uh, I guess the whole place was surrounded too by Secret Service and all no. that stuff. No. It's like maybe. It, isn't it amazing? You know how time to change. I mean, nowadays you. you that 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 room would be locked blocked off for months and months and months back then, and you'll just get the body out all with business. <laughs> yeah, you know, there were other weird things that happened. Like we played the Ventura. This will appeal to you. We we opened for wrestling in the Ventura Civic Center, and the building was uh, headline act was Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. Going on just before them, Alice Cooper. Just before Alice Cooper, boot here, <laughs> and then wrestling. 
<laughs> it's great. You know, the show started at five, and at eight thirty, wrestling would start. Yeah. <laughs> That was nineteen. And you better be out of the ring, right? <laughs> yeah, that was nineteen sixty-seven. What a what a long. I knew night I of... had a tie to wrestling. <laughs> what, yeah. What a, what a long night of entertainment! You got three different acts and then wrestling. That's a long time to be in an arena. Oh man, I, I don't know if they turned the house over or what, but <laughs> it was a weird place. Yeah. And uh, there have been a few weird places along the way. <laughs> what was it about that time? Because you had some uh, huge, high-profile banjo players. So you had Roy Clark with Hee Haw. You had Doug Dillard, who was a character on Andy Griffith, who was a big inspiration for you. Uh, you had uh, the, the Scruggs also playing with the Beverly Hillbillies. Uh, you, so you had, at a time, some terrific, high-profile banjo players on some huge, biggest TV shows in the world. You haven't really seen it since or before. What was it about that time in the banjo? It's a strange instrument. It it captivates the people that play it. They love it. They maybe it's the same if you're into the guitar, but or the fiddle. The fiddle's harder, I swear. But uh, <laughs> and uh, it was just. Uh, Roy Clark was nice to see him out there playing his, he knew about five songs and he played them really well. And, <laughs> well, no, it's, it's, it's really something to be able to play them well. And yeah. I, I don't slight him for that. He was a great guitar player. And uh, anyway, and Earl played the banjo and he played the guitar a little bit like Maybell Carter, but oh. uh, I, I don't know. And I also ended up playing mandolin and fiddle and guitar along the way. Jose Feliciano, who I was hanging out with, he, he had just moved to Southern California to Orange County. Light My Fire hadn't been a hit for him yet. Uh, uh. He was just a teenage Puerto Rican kid. He was 19, I think. And I'd drive, we'd drive around, I'd play, go up to a folk club Hey, can my friend and I play a few songs? Uh, what's the deal with the dog? Well, he's blind. Not the dog, the guy. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let him in. And we can do do two or three. And we'd end up doing an hour. Well, Jose would do most of the <laughs> hour. And I'd play banjo with him. And he he said, John, you, that banjo, you know, you're it's really good and all that, but you gotta play something else. You gotta play other things. And, and so that's when I took the mandolin and the guitar more. And, and he was right. It was good to do that. He took me, he called me up once and, and says, can you take me to this Irvine College? I've got a show up there. I figure he's playing a coffee house, you know, some kind of folky thing. We got there and the entire gymnasium was packed with people to see Jose Feliciano. <laughs> His his record "Light My Fire" had been on the radio for several weeks, and uh, that was the beginning of his career. Oh. It was, and it was like, wow, you can make money doing this. <laughs> 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 you, know, you probably wrestled a lot for free, right? I uh, close yes, to it. Did. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon. Yes, close to it. I mean, when I when I was a kid growing up in Oklahoma, started professional wrestling. You know, and the thing was, you know, if you made twenty five dollars, you were ahead of the game because you know gasoline was what seventeen cents a gallon, a six pack was ninety nine cents a six pack. As long as you could fill up your your car with with gasoline and buy a six pack for ninety nine cents, you know the night was successful. So. <laughs> How old were you then? I, well, I was right out of college. I had to be like 20, 21 years old at that time. This is 1967 and, uh, and that uh, uh, group of years back then. Back then. Wow. But we, we traveled. We, we, I, I, get a, I, get a, I had a 7 o'clock class, Don, and I told him, uh, the promoter, Leroy McGurk, called me out of the Cane Ballroom and said, we got Hot Springs, Arkansas. Can you make it? And I said, sure. And he said, okay. And so I told my mom I was still living at home going to school. 
He, she said, you got a seven o'clock class in the morning as long as you're at school at seven o'clock in the morning. So I drive 300 miles down to Hot Springs, Arkansas, pick up my $25, buy my six pack, fill my car, old Ford up, drive 300 miles back, get back just in time to go to class at seven o'clock the uh, next morning, made my mom happy. So I could continue with my pro wrestling career. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I think musicians and wrestlers have a lot in common with that. There, you know, you 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 kind of struggle in the beginning, and then if you get lucky and get get the right combination of people around you, you become successful. That's the secret there: the right combination of people around you. Yeah, and uh, my dad told me before the Nitty Gritty Dirt Bands started. I'd been playing a couple of years, and I told him. I, I want to be a musician. He goes, oh, this music thing, I think you're going down the wrong road. <laughs> I don't think you should do it. You're going to end up playing in bars and nobody's going to be listening. They'll be smoking and drinking. And you know, that's what he thought. That's what his perception of a musician was. Yeah. As a teenager, that sounded great, though, didn't it? <laughs> <Drinking the smoke. laughs> I didn't have any problem with it. But, <laughs> that's right. But he came to see us. He, he lived long enough to see a couple of shows and with the dirt van and he told me later, good luck. It's, it seems like it's working. <laughs> and uh, it did seem like it was working. He died before the first radio song though, in, uh, uh, which was 1967. And uh, any, anyway, and he bought well, what, what did you change? You mentioned me. videos. What, what did you? What did you? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Don. I was gonna say he bought me my first banjo. I got to say that my wow. That's <laughs> all I wanted. That's all you want. Yeah. That banjo sound was so unique. But what, what did you think? You know, when these videos started coming out, did you think men were doomed, or was this something right up you guys' alley, or, or what? What did you guys think of all the all the video music, the MTV generations? Uh. Well, it seemed like a, a good way to promote music. It seemed like another another place for airplay. It seemed like it was going to be good. And then it became MTV. And Michael Jackson making videos that were fantastic. and and uh, But he didn't make them alone. He had great directors and uh, producers uh, making making it all come together. But a lot of people made good videos great videos and some people a lot of people made mediocre videos <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 there were some real bad ones during that time there were some great ones but there were some real bad ones <laughs> i made a good one i made two good ones i believe uh miners night out and return to dismal swamp those are both really good videos and did you enjoy the second the one pardon sorry, go ahead i was gonna ask you did you enjoy the creative you're a very creative person. You've got books, you've got spoken word, you've had music, you have had all these different things. You produced uh, talent. Did you enjoy the creative of the videos? That's really, yeah, making it happen. I enjoyed making money making a video. <laughs> Most people don't make money at all. They spend their own money from the record company forwarding them, uh, advancing them the money. I went to the town of Deadwood and got $80,000 to make a music video that would feature Deadwood. I'll put Deadwood in the name of the, in this video four times as we walk into town, as we're in town, two places. And as we leave town, another, you are now leaving Deadwood, South Dakota. And that video, Miner's Night Out, got play. Oh, and you can have the footage. We'll cut a commercial together for you as part of the expense and you can own the footage you know and people never are allowed to own the footage right because of the ad house maker wants to oh you want another version well that'll be you know they want to own it so they can control it anyway the commercial i made one of silver star at the houston film festival and the video was played on oh 75 percent of the country music outlets at the time we got several hundred plays and it was successful and me and the director and the producer guy uh, the line producer we made some money 
<laughs> I had a crane, a camera crane, you know, that if you don't have a crane shot, it doesn't look like a movie. <laughs> but if you have a crane shot uh, and it shows up somewhere, it'll make it look like a movie. If the camera is just sitting there all the time, sitting here, sitting there, it doesn't look like a movie. <laughs> <laughs> and yes i'm sorry i'm sorry i did did you know like the times like say this this video and i say your couple of a couple of your songs that i, I really love mr bojangles and of course circle being broken did you know before these did you have a feeling these are going to be a huge hit or did they surprise you i had six uh, maybe seven times in the studio recording that i felt like <laughs> this is going to be on the radio this will be a hit mr bojangles Buy From Me the Rain was the first radio hit. Uh, Mr. Mr. Bojangles, um, Long Hard Road was 17 years into the band. We had, That was our first number one hit. First number one record, 17 years in the making. Dance Little Jean, uh, King Tut. The Dirt Band was the group that played the music for the King Tut record by Steve Martin. My brother managed Steve. We were in Aspen. Let's record King Tut. Okay. You know, you knew that was a hit. Oh, man. King Tut. Dun, 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 King Tut. When I was a young man, I never thought I'd see it. You know, it was uh, anyway. And then a, a couple others. Actually, there was a, uh, maybe three or four others, but they didn't make it. <laughs> they didn't make it to the top five or ten like I thought they should, like I thought they would. But a couple of the Dirt Band songs did. And so that's interesting when that happens. It's also interesting to be playing a song that you know is not going to be a top ten record. <laughs> Why am I recording this? Because it's good music. Uh, you know, it's just a combination of... Uh, um, but it's okay. We get to record it. Yeah. I've always found it really cool, the, the creative uh, aspect of what goes on an album or a CD nowadays. What, what, how do you pick those days, you know? And because you're dealing with new music uh, most of the time. Sometimes there's a single that's been pre-released and it makes it. But the, the creative, how, how, how does that process work? Uh, well, you try and just get as good as you can on the material and not let who wrote it get in the way. <laughs> Look, this harp player wrote this, and we promised him we'd do a song. Well, no, it's a complicated process, you know, that makes bands work. And right. it, I would say half the time, the group doesn't know what made it work. They think they did. Yeah. You know, they think they were the ones with the genius, like Little River Band. Let's change our name to LRB. That's what everybody calls us. Yeah. They changed the name. They disappeared. Hmm. They had top 10 records, LRB. There was no place to put them, the new album in the record store. LRB, what's that? Well, file it <laughs> under L, you know. <laughs> over by that little river band, you know, whatever. I like them, by the way, too. <laughs> Pardon? I like Little River Band, too. Oh, me too. One of my favorite groups. But uh, it's, um, and there's a famous story about the group that said, we need one more song for this album. What'll, what'll it be? Well, let's do that song we always rehearse in the dressing room, the vocal one. Yeah, what's it called? Dust in the Wind. <laughs> and it was the biggest record they ever had yeah and, and it just barely got on the album <laughs> yeah right and uh, that's happened many times before uh, yeah. where a songwriter will think oh i'll throw this on there it's my worst song and it comes out being his best one as far as the audience viewpoint right so it's always hard to tell what is the thought process when when you come up with a song? Uh, you know, because I've 
I'm not a creative person that creates something organically. I can look at something and say, I, I know what I want improved in it, but I can't, I'm not a person that comes up with it organically. When you think about a song, does the, the vocal, the, does the words come up to you first? The story, does the tune come up to you? Like when you, when you create something completely from scratch and you got a blank page, there's does no the rules, there, there, there are no rules. Everybody, everybody does it differently. One of my best pieces of music, I, I write a lot of instrumental music. And one of the ones that goes over the best, that goes over like a hit record, is called Acoustic Traveler. And it just, I took the, the, name, the chord, uh, names for chords and wrote them out on little pieces of paper. I threw them on the table and I picked them out. Instead of, you know, I said, I'm going to try and write some. Okay. Oh, I'll move this one over here. Okay, I'll do that. Because that was... And, I'll leave the rest. Okay, now play to that chart. I made it a music chart that I play the song to. And it ends up being one of my, uh, one of the audience's favorite recordings. People come up after the show. That instrumental you played, what record is it on? Or where can I get that? Or how can I, you know? And it's like, oh man, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I put a lot of time into that. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, sometimes sometimes some of the things I've played recording with other people is it just happens when we're doing it. Okay. Now there's a lot that goes on before that, leading up to it, or practicing or whatever, and you get in the studio and you're actually making something, and then it it comes out you know a basic idea will turn into a whole song but i don't know if there's any rules in it. i just always thought it's so interesting how people come up with different things creatively and get to get to the end result but so many people get there from so many different uh directions and so many different ways yes sir now how, how did you guys end up uh 1977 in russia we took a plane <laughs> It was like a whole other country over there. Uh, no, we, the Russians were committed to bringing over an American group. We bring over the ballet. We bring over the string quartet. We bring over X, Y, Z. And now you have to bring over an American diplomatic group. Diplomatic meaning a group that makes its own decisions for its own music and own music choices and they ended up looking at groups like chicago and the eagles and the grateful dead the grateful dead was like oh no not that but uh it was they ended up picking the nitty-gritty dirt band thanks to david hess who was a uh, cultural affairs guy in in the u.s government and he was also a dirt band fan and he helped promote that idea and we did 28 sold out shows. Wow. At an average of 2,200 to 5,000 people. And it was wonderful. It was really did you find a Russian crowd different than, than a US crowd? Or when you go around, like we worked at uh, the Orient a lot, excuse me. And the people in, over in the Orient are a lot different. They're a lot harder to reach, a lot harder to get. You got to do something really special to. To get a reaction out of them. Did you find that uh, when when you toured Russia? Yeah. In general, it was like we were representing American music. We did Buddy Holly songs. We did a uh, a Chuck Berry song. We did a, a couple other unusual songs along with the Dirt Band music, and took a female singer with us to represent the female side of. American music featured her doing Georgia, which really killed them because they thought they were singing about Georgia, Soviet Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was it was amazing. The best way I can describe what you're saying is the tour guide. We had three tour guides. Two were party members, and one was in charge, and she wasn't a communist party member 
but she was really good. That's why she was in charge. But the one of the party members, Arena, blonde hair, up here, red dress every night, you know, red dress because we're in Russia. And when you get to Leningrad, it will not be like the audience in Riga here or in Latvia, in in down in in Armenia. They're crazy down there. They're, they, they go crazy, but in Leningrad, you will get good applause, I'm sure. You may get an encore. It might be good, but it will be different. It will <laughs> be Leningrad. And we were coming off stage after the third encore in Leningrad. Arena is <laughs> in the wings. I'll never forget looking at her. She's going, I never thought in Leningrad. And what she had seen was people coming up to the stage, which was illegal, a girl running up and kissing the guitar player on the second encore, which was highly illegal, a guy coming up and playing air guitar with one of the guys, and which was highly illegal, and they'd run back in the audience, and we're getting ready to go on for the fourth encore, or a new revolution was going to start. And... <laughs> We were playing in the October Revolution Hall, so that kind of fit together. Anyway, I told Arena, I said, yes, American music affects people, Arena. It's great. We're going to go do another song now. And uh, I never thought in Leningrad, in Riga, in Latvia, in, in, in Moscow, that was weird because... In Moscow, there's a guy sitting here, 15 minutes into the show, he gets up and runs out. He runs back in, sits down after about three minutes. A guy over here gets up and runs out after 20 minutes. And then, yeah. The guy over here runs out after 15, 20 minutes. And what I found out, this happened for three shows. And it wasn't everybody, but it was certain groups here, here, over here. And they had bought timeshare tickets. <laughs> wow. I have, I have I've never heard of that one before. That's a new one to me, timeshare tickets. Yeah. So it was like, I have, oh, my 20 minutes. Could you sell your timeshare? Huh? Could you sell your timeshare? <laughs> yeah. Oh, three people would get together and buy one ticket because they, yeah. were, they were like a whole month's salary, you know? Yeah. It wasn't yeah. that much, but to the non-party member, it was a lot. And they go, okay, I okay, I see it up now. And it was really funny. Okay, yeah, yeah I'd be so disappointed. I'd have circle be unbroken. Well, my time's up. I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the fallout from the Russia tour, is it like nitty gritty now has this great following uh, 50 years later in Russia? I mean, because you were the one band that got to come over and play for them. So you're part of that Russian history. We have had effects. There's a band called Kukuruza, which means corn in Russian. Uh, they started after we were there. There's another bluegrass band. I can't think of the name. There's a, a group called the Swamp Shakers in Latvia. I would say it's a very slow effect, but you know, I think we had an effect. That's awesome, though. What what a wonderful experience. Yeah, it was really, it was really weird. It was really wonderful. And now after yeah, 50 years, it up today, John, uh, on, on the on on your uh, on your news news band. I mean, that's I, 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 John and I both uh, received a press copy of it yesterday. It's so fascinating. And how, how did that? How did you develop that? I mean, it's a unique. I'd never, I honestly, I'd never listened to a spoken word uh, uh, before, and I, I I found myself really uh, uh, enthralled with it. Uh, of course, some of the some of the background music, you know, the the old old school music, uh, was, was some of my favorite favorite music of, of all time too. So, how how did you come up with with this spoken word? Uh, you ever heard uh, of Luke the Drifter? Sure. You know? Yes. You have, and Briscoe has it. Uh, Luke the Drifter was Hank Williams' senior. Uh, he would yeah. do, he would do talking blues. He did fly trouble. 
You ever heard Johnny Cash's A Boy Named Sue? Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. You ever heard Arlo Guthrie do Alice's Restaurant? Or Devil oh, Went yeah. Down, Devil Went Down to Georgia? Yeah. These are all talking songs. Oh, yeah. You know? The, the, the so, one, the Johnny Cash song, what was the title of that? Boy Named Sue. Boy Named Sue, yeah. His, his, the, the one on there, the, 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 what, the, the cremation of, 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 the, of the guy. Day. Yeah, I, I, Johnny Cash did that years ago, didn't he? Oh, well, it was Alabama. written. It was written in 1906. Okay. And Johnny Cash did do it. Oh. And this is very strange, but I think I did a better version. <laughs> yeah, I do too. I did too. I, I, I listened to it twice just to make sure I was right on that assumption. <laughs> he did a he did a fine job of just of narrating the poem, but I tried to make it into a movie. Yeah, so how, how how did all that come about? I mean, uh, after you were so unique. How did the the spoken word album? Asking how did how did the, the album collaboration come about? On the newsman. Yes. Well, it it took a period of years to put it together. I uh, did not treat it lightly. I I had to realize that I can't sing, and that takes some effort that as, as much as I want to sing and as much as I do when I play live, I'm not a singer. And when you put out a record and you're singing on it, you're competing with everybody. And hmm, nobody's touched the spoken word. And I've been told, I love your stories. I love it when you tell stories. I love it when you do the whippoorwill. I love it. So why don't I go to the easy thing? And and I I have done spoken words since when I started playing guitar. I couldn't sing then either. <laughs> and I do things like every time I come to town, the boys keep kicking my dog around. It makes no <laughs> difference if he is a hound. They gotta quit kicking my dog around. You know, and people would laugh and stuff, but oh, well, it's and then. Some other things that come along, like Old Rivers was a hit in 1963 by Walter Brennan. Yeah. And I'd had that in my head since then. And last November, I sat down and went, I'm going to do Old Rivers. Yeah. It's perfect. And I, I tried to figure out some, figured out some music. And I found out that Leon Russell had played on the original. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Back in 1963. Anyway, that was just a sidebar. Hmm. But uh, so I knocked out Old Rivers in four hours, including mixing. And yeah. it was really fun. Yeah. It was really fun to, to do something effectively, have an idea of what it should be and go in and do it. That was me. You know, it's funny when I saw I I heard you explain that on one of your interviews before about the devil went down to Georgia, and I didn't put the two and two together. You know, we we've got a lot of spoken word, like boy named Sue. We've got a lot of this in, in our history. It's just you, when you hear spoken word, you don't associate it with what you've already heard. The story with your newsman, I think, is the the young kid with the cerebral palsy. It's just it's just a great story. Oh, you know, really? when you hear the backstory on it, it's just you li you listen to it, you think this is really cool. That guy was such an inspiration. He worked his butt off. The one that uh, that's the one piece I wrote uh, started the album is dedicated to Steve, the newsman, and uh, he'd drive around Hollywood with his motor scooter covered with papers and sell them all. And he must have made a killing because people gave him a dollar or two dollars or three dollars. And this was when a newspaper cost twenty five cents people would buy them but uh he was he was really good he couldn't talk very well and i was always embarrassed that i didn't really talk to him i was a teen i was i was i was i was young i was stupid when i was young well, i was whatever you know i mean he would you like to buy a paper you know and very actually worse than that but it would be yeah sure here here's here's a buck you know give me a paper you know and some people would talk to him and i missed that opportunity 
this guy must have had a fantastic life to be able to to have the what drove him to oh. do this. He's up at five in the morning. He's working until five in the afternoon. Yeah. Anyway, I could never complain about my job. Hmm. You know, that, that's a great perspective on, on looking at people too. You, know, you you never know, you know, what's what's setting next to you. I, I find it fascinating sometimes on the airplane, you know, I'm sitting there just strike up a conversation. The unique people that, that you meet and can meet, you know, sitting next to somebody. If if you just take the time to, to ask them a little bit about this. Everybody likes to talk about themselves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And now they have the airplane, if you can get them to unplug their headphones. That's right. That's yeah. Right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, if you can get them, that's, that's the whole key. Once you see them take that out, you know you got them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, RB, RB, like some of us, just have headphones in with nothing playing, so nobody will talk to you. Oh, <laughs> that's a good idea. <laughs> and you you uh, you had recently when the album was coming out you had a triple bypass uh surgery uh pretty recently how are you feeling now uh oh did I, lose uh -oh. You? I was just pulling that, that oh, that question got oh, right. oh my goodness <laughs> what a go john <laughs> what a go my partner john <laughs> yeah uh, i'm feeling fine i feel i'm feeling better than than i imagined my wife was showing me some pictures of me on the air machine in the hospital, and what a miserable sight that was. But thanks to a brilliant medical team and the ER guys that saved me, because I had a, I was coming up to a stop sign, I passed out and hit the car in front of me. My wife's eye watch said, you've been in an accident, 911 has been called. And <sighs> as I woke up and she's trying, shaking, me she's standing on the road on the driver's side now get wake up wake what's well, where are you and huh oh 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 my car's messed up oh there's an ambulance <laughs> it was like it was uh started a 17 day stay in the e in the er in the icu at the wonderful saint john's uh hospital in nashville and i had a, two heart attacks and did you know they were coming on john or did, oh, did no. they just happen they just know. happened i didn't even know when they i happened. had four i had four strokes myself so that's reason i'm kind of curious on what, what what you were feeling you were feeling fine up until that time what i had 97 percent blockage on one artery and 98 percent on another unfortunately you have other arteries that handle the blood going to your brain but I was, I ended up getting a triple bypass yeah. and that was, uh, took the vein out of my leg. I didn't even, uh, have, didn't have any problem with that, but, uh, and no pain really. I feel oh, very I'm, I'm, I'm glad you didn't have friends like my friend, John, up in the corner. My wife called him and said, John, Gerald Jones laying on the floor. He, he just, or John, John, tell us, tell us. Your conversation with yeah, my wife. I, I called. I called down to uh, Jerry's wife, Barbara, who's been, been married forever, and I said, "How's Jerry doing?" Because I knew he had had a heart attack. She said, "Well, he's laying on the floor. He's incoherent." I said, "That's Friday afternoon." <laughs> <laughs> like the old days. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How can you tell the difference? <laughs> you can when you're laying there, right? Now. <laughs> yeah. Hey, John, I can't thank you enough for coming on. It's been, it's such a treat to have you on. American Newsman is the new, uh, the, the new album. And are you touring with the new album? Are you, are you doing a spoken word tour? I'm not doing a, a spoken word tour, but I'm doing some dates that involves early Nitty Gritty Dirt Band music and music from the Circle Be Unbroken album and a few cuts from the Newsman. You know, I don't know, but what it feels like to you but usually when you go see a group and they go here's our new album and they do eight songs from the new album and you don't know any of them 100 percent, it can get boring yeah you know i want to hear the so i make sure i only do two or three and they're spaced <laughs> out right. between you know uh, sure After mr bojangles i'll sneak in one and like that but uh 
Did you have a favorite group that was a collaboration? Because you had so many collaborations for Circle Be Unbroken. You know, so many different guys wanted to be part of that song because it was such an iconic song. Did you have a favorite collaboration of stars that got together? That has... Yeah, well, yeah, you had Johnny Cash in one, you had Roy Cat Acuff in one. You've had so many people have done with you guys. Um, I would say I would say Johnny Cash is definitely a, a a star on my resume or whatever you want to call it because well, he was just a special person, you know. I did a show with Johnny Cash and well, I was out. We were in Europe doing a multi-date tour one of the days was off and he took a date in wales and i parked my banjo in the lobby because i knew he's coming out the lobby and and hey john good to see you uh, june and i are going to go over to wales and play some songs you want to come play on the carter family songs uh. he said sure uh, let me think about it yes <laughs> and, give me a minute and i reached behind this tree in the lobby and got my banjo. This is I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> now, in that show, he had two shows and about two thousand people a show. I'm going to take a minute to introduce you now before they bring you out in the middle there. He entered, goes through this introduction, and now here he is. Here he is. Make him welcome, John McEwen, and people kind of like this. And between sets, he goes, I, I, I think I could do better. You might have to wait a little bit longer next time. I, I think I could do better. And I don't know what he's talking about. He can do better. So it comes around to that part of the show, and he starts talking about Roy Clark, Chet Atkins. And these words start coming out, Chet Atkins and Earl Scruggs. And then then I realize he's talking about me. And he gets around, he's spinning like a whole minute and he gets around and, and he's here because he wants to be folks. He's here because he playing with June Carter and Johnny Cash, he couldn't turn it down. Please make him feel welcome. His first time in Wales and the place <laughs> went crazy and they stood up. Everybody stood up. I got a standing ovation from a bunch of people that didn't know me. <laughs> <laughs> and after the show cash just walked up to me and went i, I told you i could do better <laughs> <laughs> and that was really telling to me because he he wanted to do better than what he had done and he knew he could and he did yeah. anyway what a great story John, hey, John, I, we, we took a ton of your time, but I tell you, I could have taken all day. It's, thank you so much for joining us. It's been such a pleasure having you on. And since uh, Mr. Briscoe, my dear friend, he's the one that hired me 30 years ago in, in wrestling. Uh, and uh, since he, that's and we've been good friends ever since. Uh, since he told me we're having you on, I've been so excited. And so has he. Which one? Did you wrestle him? No. Never, never in the ring. <laughs> never outside of if I, we're, we're, we're talking about that 30 day tour, you know, you got to do things, you know, that, that entertain yourself after the show. One morning, we're all getting on a bus because we got an early morning bus ride. I get on the bus, and I look at my arms, they're all scratched up. I look at my knees, they're all scratched up. Here comes John. He's all scratched up. We don't know what the hell happened. John, take over. <laughs> yeah. And somebody gets on the bus and said, Are you two done? And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> they said, you guys were out wrestling last night in the parking lot at 3 o'clock in the morning. Oh, my God. <laughs> and neither one of us remembers it. <laughs> oh. So, yeah, we've we, had a we lot of had some good road trips down the line there. We, we kind of turn on a rock and roll uh, persona after after the shows. And our buses, you know, as most tour buses are, they were loaded with your favorite uh, alcoholic beverages, adult beverages there. So we took full advantage of it. We got to the hotel. We were just starting, you know, so we had to had to carry it on out in the parking lot. <laughs> oh, a lot of great. I like rock and roll. Rock and rollers don't do that, right? <laughs> I, uh, Jerry, I, I, I never did any drugs. I never did any alcohol, so I don't uh, know. Really? Wow. And and I never bragged about it, but since you kind of brought it up, uh, I remember once in Portland, nineteen eighty seven. I, I had a joint in my hand that 
I, I have drugs end up in front of me on stage. A little pile of, oh, a block of hash and then a couple of joints yeah. and then, oh, there's some pills. You know, whatever. I give it to the roadies. I was their favorite person. Yeah. But I took this joint to my room and I lit it, like lit one end of it and got it burning. And I went, no, wait a minute. If this makes you feel more like you do now, I, I'm I'm kind of depressed. I, uh, I'm I'm not feeling that good. If this makes you amplify the way you're feeling, I don't want to am. I threw it out the window. I, I just, <laughs> good for you. <laughs> and I, I always wonder. No, I I don't wonder. But uh, I was road managing, and and I had six kids. Yeah, you had you had work to do. <laughs> Yeah, and there was work to do, and I yeah. just didn't see the point in it. I would get mad at people. I'd say, you do not go on the road to get high. That's what you do at home when you're sitting around bored with your wife. Get high. When you're sitting around trying to figure out there's nothing to watch on TV. Not when people are going to pay to see you because you don't play as good when you're high. You think you, you, think do. you do, but you don't. <laughs> yeah, you think you do, but you don't. And you don't sing. You do cocaine. You can't sing as high. Uh, you're cutting off a couple of your high notes. And anyway, it's a never mind. I don't want to be a preacher. But no, it's not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> good. So I heard, I heard uh, David Crosby in an interview in 2012. The guy asked him, after a pretty extensive interview, they said, well, what about the drugs, David? He, he immediately went, drugs? They didn't do anything. Nothing positive. They didn't do anything. I wish I hadn't done them. It, you know, I did a lot of drugs, but they didn't do anything. Creative moments, I had them anyway, without them. And, and he, just, he was really Mr. Anti-Drug. Wow. I wish he would have done that 20 years earlier. <laughs> But he didn't know. He didn't know. And it, it's an interesting thing. It's an amazing thing, though, because some of the most creative people had massive drug problems. You know, I'm talking about some of the most inspirational people, you know, that, that do incredible things. And you always wonder, would they have been better without it? Or was this just they just had so much extra bandwidth, their their mind just went a thousand miles an hour when the world's going 50 and they need some way to try to cope with their mind not in sync with the world. It's just interesting to me that so many incredible talents have had all kinds of vices that you think would take away from that talent. And you wonder, do they go hand in hand? Or, or is it just what the, what is the reason is, for it? What I've seen is people have talents and they're up till their 20, 21, 22, a lot of creative talent that writes songs, does paintings, does things, and they keep developing them. And the drugs come in and they can't stop those talents. In fact, yes, they enhance sometimes. They may make it better, but the talent would still be there if they did nothing, if they didn't do any enhancing enhancement right but their earlier creations are hard to beat and they go and they repeat themselves and they repeat and they repeat and people are loving the things they did when they weren't high right Maybe they don't talk about it like oh when, before i got high i wrote this song you know but and well, take some of the biggest people in show business. Steve Martin. He doesn't get high. He doesn't drink. You know, Oprah Winfrey. She doesn't get high. Uh, Taylor Swift. Can you picture her <laughs> with a line of coke? I don't think so. Right. You know? uh, Taylor Swift's a really good example of somebody doing it right. Yeah, and everything has changed. You know, most you know our, our business has changed. Guys don't drink anymore. Guys, don't, you know, now they drug test, and so you can't do drugs. And so, you know, the world's changed, and the business is business is bigger than ever. So it, that's a very positive thing. A lot of lives have been saved because of uh, the changes in the business that we have right now. From guys, you know, our, the lifestyle of when we were younger was bad. <laughs> it was really bad, and fortunately, they've cleaned that up, and business is now better than ever. I just think it's interesting that you had such great talent sometimes. I'm talking about, you know, painters and, and 
philosophers, all kinds of people. And they had some really crazy uh, problems, you know, psychotic problems with drugs and different things. And you just wonder if they didn't have that, could they still have done as much? Or was it just that they had so much extra bandwidth that they migrated that because they the world was too slow for them? You know, I, I just find it an interesting thought. Yeah, it's uh, hard to know. <laughs> it is, it is. But John, hey, we, we've taken a ton of your time and I can't thank you enough. It, this is a, a well, true- I appreciate, uh, I appreciate getting the word of the news man out because it is really hard nowadays to get the words, get the music out, get the, the notice out of a, a project you might have. And I've spent 56 years in the music business and this is, I think this is my most important project. It's wow. different. You know, it's different. It's mainly my music. It's me delivering everything. It's my choice of the photograph. My wife took the photograph. I just, honey, quick, out on the porch, take a picture. I've got this hat. I think this is a good shot. Like this. Okay, yeah. And, you know, the uh, picture that's on the back of the cover. And, uh, it all came together like that. And that's one thing that make, made it right for me. It wasn't a struggle getting this album together. It was a, it was a fun thing. One, one last question. Are you on the road now? Are you traveling with, uh, as, as yourself? Are you with, with the group or anything? Are you on the road? My question. I have taken, I take out a few people with me. Uh, Les Thompson, one of the original Nitty Gritty Dirt Band members. He plays with me, plays bass. And uh, then Danny Nicely, a great guitar player who's won contests and stuff. And sometimes uh, John Cable, a previous Dirt Band member. And, uh, <laughs> and often people I pick up along the way who <laughs> wanted to play with me. Yeah. I these people that, oh, I've always wanted to, I've had you on my bucket list. I've wanted to play with you. I, you know, I say, okay. That's, that's got to be such a tremendous compliment, though, John. You know, like, hey, I've always wanted to play with you. Can I sit in? You know, and uh, wow, I mean, the, the, some of the magic really happens when that, when, when that, when that situation happens, right? Yeah, there's always a place for them, too. <laughs> Well, the album is The Newsman. This is Mr. John McEwen. Uh, John, thank you so much. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you.